see our body language and expressions they are typically the ones that sit in the in the front rows because they have to observe you that's how they learn best and then there are the kinesthetic or tactile learners who need to be doing things with you either because they watch you first so these are the ones that are drawing writing taking notes so they are involved so there are different kinds of learners so that may be one reason why the learning experience is not uniform for everybody and they do not all leave the classroom every day with the same with the same confidence there are only so many different learning experience learning preferences that we can incorporate into a lesson plan so just as quick examples if you are teaching economics and you are trying to explain market equilibrium there are two ways you can do it you can show them graphically how what what it means for the market to be in equilibrium you can algebraically show them how we Uh, determine what the equilibrium price and quantity is but you probably do not have enough class time to do both approaches every time an example from statistics i paused for a minute because i cannot see any of the uh, audience tiles but that's okay um if you're teaching statistics and you are explaining the um, how to calculate probability of the union of two events for non mutually exclusive events you can either show them the formula probability of a union b equals probability of a plus probability of b minus probability of a intersection b you can draw a venn diagram you can use both so the way i do it is i'll explain both when i'm explaining the concept <laughs> then for every single problem I do not have enough class time to show them both approaches both times so when I'm explaining the concept and maybe the very first problem that I work out I'll tell them to pay careful attention so that they can pick which one they like which one clicks for them right so I'm giving them the choice so that they can choose what kind of learner they are and what kind what method they want to use but I cannot use it for every single problem every time Right so this is a big reason why everyone does not have the same learning experience I'm I'm sorry to ask this but would some of you please uh, mute your microphone there's a lot of background noise in my ear I think someone is uh, doing something so I request everyone to kindly mute your microphone thank thank you um a second thank Please you very much your microphone uh, thank you ma'am yes thank you so another reason why experience in an in class session may not be uniform is because the pace of the lesson right as instructors we determine the pace we like to make sure we carry at least half of the class with us otherwise the class is very slow or very fast but no matter how much you try to do that you probably never have the optimal pace So no matter how slow you go the pace of the lesson may still be too fast for some students but a lot of students are very hesitant to ask questions in class or at least my students are and what seems to be preventing them from asking questions is that they are afraid that they will come across as quote unquote dumb because they didn't understand it when i explained or quote unquote stupid because they're asking for a second time and no matter how many times you say that you are willing to explain it many times there are some students who will not ask questions so when they don't ask questions then you keep explaining something else you are constantly building things but these students have fallen behind so the gaps in their understanding linger and keep growing so they snowball so so if that's what is preventing everyone from having a same learning experience then blended learning providing them resources outside of the classroom can make the learning experience just a little less heterogeneous Okay, so those are the advantages of blended learning. So, returning to what blended learning is, the resource or the website blendedlearning.org. This is their description of blended learning. A lot of elements are the same ones that we have talked about before. Learning is in part online, in part in person, at a brick and mortar location. Schools, colleges, universities, away from home. and now the key thing that they talk about is that because you are blending the in person learning with the offline or with the online sorry resources then these two have to be integrated very well otherwise they may seem like two disjointed things and students seem like you are asking for a lot of work from them 
So it is only when they see how the two, how the elements connect and integrate, that's where the blend comes from. That's when the learning experience can be richer. So blendedlearning.org essentially says the modalities along a student's learning path are connected to provide an integrated learning experience. So at this point, I'll share my experience and how I blend. So my first introduction to this whole different way of teaching or additional things of teaching um, that are beyond me just talking in the classroom, using the chalkboard, using the whiteboard, all of that happened very early on in my career. When I used to teach a lot of math classes, algebra and statistics, I would work out problems, I would assign students a set of problems to solve. And when they were in class, students would be able to work out the problems just fine. And some of them would volunteer to come up to the chalkboard and work it out for extra credit and things like that. And yet when they would go home and they would have to solve the homework problems, they would come back to class the next day and say those were very hard. And I would ask why those were exactly the same types of problems that we did in class. And then what they articulated came across to me. So what I heard was that my mere presence the fact that they knew I was there to help, that psychologically seemed like a big thing. So that helped them. That's why being in class was easier. Now, if I think about it a little more, there are certainly other things that when they're solving, they can check their answer. They can ask the person sitting next to them. So there's all the entire social aspect of learning that probably helps. But in their minds, the important thing is I was there versus I was not there. And I kind of remember I told them, but I can't be in every one. I cannot come to all your houses in the evening. So what do we do about it? And someone suggested, can I make videos? And that's how I created or recorded my first set of video lectures. And then there was a long journey. I was introduced. So at that point, I don't think I knew the concept of blended learning. So as far as I was concerned, I was creating video lectures. I shared those with my students. I asked them to provide feedback. And I said, all right, anything that seems difficult, you can tell me and I will create videos on an as needed basis. So that's the way I first got into this. And then it was a long journey. I did a certificate course in online teaching and learning. That's when I think I first learned the concept of blended learning. I got into that course confident that uh, subjects like economics and statistics cannot have any online components, but uh, then I was introduced to all this educational technology that exists that helps us essentially replicate everything that we do in class, a writing tablet, for example, and recording software, and then you can record much nicer. So my first videos may not have had any writing on them. It might just have been me talking and me using Excel, but my later videos I'm essentially doing everything that I would do in the classroom. But then in shorter um, durations, because when someone is watching a video, the attention span is much smaller. Versus in class, when I'm walking around, I talk for a while, then I give them problems to solve. So there's a mix of different things going on. But, what, but watching the whole thing over video may be hard. So when you do videos, you make short five to 10 minute videos. So I learned all of those tools and tricks. So now my typical class looks like this. So how do I blend? So what I have here is, so we use Canvas uh, learning management system at our university, and that's where I put in all my resources. So the screenshot that I have here is from one chapter in my statistics class. This, so this chapter is about discrete probability distributions. All the items that are enclosed in that brick orange kind of uh, rectangle, those are all the supplementary resources I provide for them. Okay, so to recap, in class, I explain everything, we do problems, but then there are all these resources that are already provided online so that when a student is working out problems at home or reading the chapter at home, and suddenly they see a gap in their notes or they think it would be nice if Professor Roy could explain this a second time, then they know that they have those videos there that they can watch. And these days, textbook publishers also provide their own sets of videos. So my students actually have that choice also. The set of resources I provide, the set of resources that the publisher provides, okay? So they have all these resources, and in the blue block, I have the assignments. 
So most of the assignments, so homework, quizzes, in this is a statistics class, so they do data exercises, um, they do all of this outside of class. Okay, but because it integrates, so they know that they have to pick and choose. It's not, not like they have to do everything that I'm saying, that I have put there. So they know I'm not asking for four times as much time as they spent in class. So they know that all of this is optional. Use it as needed, but these have to be completed by their due dates. Okay, so this is how I plan. So we need to talk about the supplementary resources a little. So a snapshot of one of those, what is the binomial distribution? So again, in class, I have explained all of this, but for the auditory visual learners who cannot just read the textbook to do it by themselves a second time, I put a little bit of what I have said in class and the video I have here is a YouTube video. So I don't record all my videos. Over the years that I have been teaching, I have spent countless hours on YouTube looking for videos where the narrators are explaining things exactly the way I would explain. And if, that, if I like the way they're explaining, then I'll use that. If I do not find anything that explains just the way I would have liked it, then I record. Okay, so here is the lesson on a binomial distribution. So anyone can explain that. And this is a narrator that I liked. So I provided a link to that. And then students like solved problems. If they see a solved problem video, then it is easier for them to do others. And though we have done it in class together, when they go back home, their class notes have become static. So they want to watch me explaining another time. So for that, I record videos. So this is a problem video, problem solving video, where I'm telling, where I'm showing them again how to calculate probabilities, how to understand that the problem involves a binomial situation or an experiment, and how they'll calculate it. Okay, so this is a resource I create. So I have a mix of those narrators who I like and then solve problem videos or lectures also when I do not find someone that explains things exactly the way I would have. That exercise that I talked about, they have to read about it, understand it, do it, everything outside of class. If they do not understand some instruction, then they can ask me in class. So this here is a snapshot of the first part of the data exercise, where now that you have understood what a discrete probability distribution is. This happens to be a data exercise where they, where I randomly pick um, incomes from income distribution tables and they have to spot. So they are looking at it as the internal revenue service doing tax audits and just looking at those returns that were filed. Can they spot fraud? Okay. So it is a real world exercise where they have to apply Benford's law. So the Benford's law itself, I don't talk about in class. They have to understand this on their own. Okay, so this is about blended learning and how I blend. If any of you were interested in starting or exploring blended learning, then there are many different ways to do this. So there are options. You can do all of it or some of it. So I started out with supplementary resources online because my students think my, my uh, courses are very hard. So that's how I started. And then there are the inter there are some interactive self-paced activities that they can do. There are the assignments that they do online and student-student interaction is essentially discussions. So our traditional online, asynchronous online classes have students interact by participating in discussions because they are not physically in the classroom and they cannot talk to each other. So you give them discussion prompts and you have them, you force them essentially to talk to each other. And some of them enjoy those discussions so much that they become friends because they figure they have the same viewpoint and they all understand the same thing and so on. So if you wanted to experiment with this, a textbook, not a textbook, a book by Garrison and Vaughn is a very useful resource for those of you who may want to explore. So Garrison and Vaughn explain blended learning as a five-step procedure. In the first step, you as the faculty, as the instructor, want to think about what do you want your students to know at the end of the lesson? What are the key learning outcomes? What knowledge, skills, etc. would you like them to know? From your existing course format, what would you want to preserve? Are there any handouts you give them, any notes, anything that you could reuse? And then in the structure of your lesson. So from your lesson plan, what do you want to preserve? And what among those can be shifted to the online medium. So that's the thinking you want to do. So what would you like to transform? That's the first step. 
In the second step, you design that. Now that you have decided these can stay offline, these can be put online, now you think about the integration. What type of learning activities will integrate the face-to-face -face time with the out-of-class components? So in the example that I provided, in class we do the lessons, we do the problems, but then offline, or online rather, when they're out of class, then they can review again shorter videos if they need that, but those exercises, the quizzes, these have to be done. So the quizzes come to the next part. How will these learning activities be assessed? What weight do I put on them? When do they become due? How quickly do they have to complete them? Can they come to me if they need help? So all of those have to be thought out. And then how much of time are you asking for? For our classes, we typically say one hour in class requires three to four hours outside of class. So given that those three to four hours, students could have been struggling reading the book versus they can now watch videos, I'm not asking really for any extra time. And I like to think that my students understand that because on day one, I explain all of this to them. So step two is the design. Step three, here is where the development comes in. Blended learning does require a learning management system that everyone uses. At our university, we use Canvas. Over the years, I have uh, used many different learning management systems at different institutions. Um, Blackboard is a very popular one in the United States. In India, to the best of my knowledge, during COVID, Microsoft Teams and Google Classroom were being used as um, some kind of learning management system. I have not used those platforms more than video conferencing platforms with people who use them. So I'm not very familiar with how much you can do in those. And then there is Moodle that uh, I have a little familiarity with from others in India working on them. So Moodle seems to be popular in India because it is open source. You have to decide what resources you will reuse, what you will create what you will uh, curate from resources available online. Like I said, I use a lot of YouTube videos. Okay? And then you'll have to think about any new learning activities or content that you need to develop if you are recording videos, if you're creating a new data exercise and things like that. For implementing, you need necessary approvals. So if you're, so in India, I think the policy is laid down by the UGC are essentially guiding documents. So the interpretation of how much of your course can be online probably comes into play here. Does UGC really mean number of courses that you can have online versus on campus, or is it a percent of a course? If it, if it can be interpreted as a percent of a course, then that's where blended learning would fit in because you are saying part of my lessons are online. Um, in India, I'm sure uh, any faculty wanting to implement blended learning would need the principal's approval. So we have the principals of the two colleges here today. So I'm thinking that that wouldn't be a problem if you wanted to experiment. You would have to provide support for students. So your technology support uh, plays a big role here because they would have to help out with the technology you're using if students have problems. And you would also have to provide initial support so students know how to manage their time. Anything that you do with a new um, kind of strategy you are using requires evaluation. Just as an aside, this is where some, there is a scholarship potential or a research potential. So evaluating whether students who, who uh, you were teaching in the blended learning format, did they do better than the students who were just doing the traditional format? So you want to assess whether the blended learning course was effective. There are many different ways to do that and then a plan for continuous improvement. For me, the plan for continuous improvement typically means I have to refresh the resources, especially with economics and finance, when I'm trying to bring in uh, uh, topical examples, those of course become dated by the time I'm teaching it a second time. So I constantly have to look for what new examples, what new real world event am I going to ask them to assess or think about. Okay? And then the continuous improvement for me, is, is there something else students are saying is hard, but I don't have a video on that? So then I'll create those. So that's the continuous improvement that happens. So if you are, if you are wanting to experiment, you certainly want to know, is blended learning effective? Sure, I can evaluate it, but what does research already show? So this is the last part of my presentation today. 
And I only have a select set of references with the, the time constraint in mind. So there is this study by Ayob et al. I think it was conducted in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they uh, essentially looked at student outcome or student achievement in classes that use blended learning and classes that did not use blended learning. They found that the outcomes were not homogeneous, as in they did not always find a statistically better performance. So student achievement was better with blended learning in some courses, but not in others. In the larger literature, this is where the difficulty level of a course is uh, analyzed in detail. Okay? Because it would seem reasonable to expect that courses that are difficult, that's where that students consider difficult. That's where the blended learning format helps more. Whereas if the student is leaving class every day, confident they have understood, then whether or not you are providing resources online probably does not affect their performance so much. Now, I personally, I said that I am at a point in my career where I have used this long enough that I am convinced that it is the better way to teach. Uh, during the pandemic, when learning went remote and I taught from home for a whole year, um, I analyzed essentially to evaluate my own performance, whether I had somehow compromised on students' learning experiences because of the change in format. I analyzed student performance in my own classes and I found that performance was fairly consistent. I, and I attribute a lot of this to the fact that I use blended learning. And an additional thing there is that during COVID, all our class lessons would be recorded. So that became an additional resource, which of course, if you're teaching offline, then when students leave class, they don't have that. So COVID is a slightly different story, but I attribute the consistency a lot to the fact that I use blended learning. Another study by Vo et al. found that blended learning was associated with greater learning performance in STEM disciplines. So science, technology, engineering, and math. Again, that's where the difficulty level becomes important. Those are courses that students consider difficult. So a lot of interaction with the course is required with the course content. And those are the classes where they found that blended learning was most effective. So to summarize what I talked about today, Blended learning combines the benefits of in-person and online learning. It removes the constraints of each one. So the constraint of the in-person learning was that when students leave the classroom, nothing goes with them. Textbook becomes their only resource in most cases. The constraint of online learning is unless the student is self-motivated and disciplined, then it is difficult to do online learning. I shared my experience in blended learning and how I blend online and offline. Um, blended learning can be implemented in small manageable steps and the book by Garrison and Vaughan, you know, the handbook is a very useful resource. Um, research has showed so far that well-designed blended classes can improve student learning outcomes. And that's all I have for today. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, ma'am, it was really yeah. an extensive explanation about blended learning. Uh, well, I have a question from my side because when you are saying all these points, uh, I might have I have gone through many of them at different point of time. Uh, as you said, right? You know the biggest question you said that the, we are the principals of two colleges, uh, and my experience also sh says that you know, particularly in the Indian context where so much of rural villages are there, rural uh, climate is there, rural ambience is there, and the students are not so adapted towards going for a blended learning mode. More so, uh, we saw this during COVID, when we had a um, horrible time in you know, maintaining those, uh, you know, the, the hybrid learning mode, right? It took a long, long time. The first was the issue of network connectivity, even today, we face it in different places, right? Uh, second thing is that the accessibility in terms of cost, right, and infrastructure. Now, how do you think India in that context per se will be a place where blended learning can be grown to a more greater extent in the days to come? That is a great question. And thank you so much for asking that. I have thought about it actually quite a bit because in the Indian context, it just happens to be that IGNO is really the largest provider of online and distant learning. 
And anything that I read, Igno also publishes a lot of research about mm. how their uh, delivery of learning has changed as we have moved right. from the days right. when they used to send everything by post to the way they do it now. And it seems like they have figured out a way that works because I think what they do is in rural villages, they have physical centers that students can go to, whereas in urban areas, that's how they disseminate mostly via online. And I think the thinking there is, even if a student themselves do not have internet at home, and this is before COVID, then they have cyber cafes. I think IGNO has figured out a way, and I wish there was a way for IGNO to actually take the lead here and share more, and they do that via their research, but how they are doing this, right? Because they are the ones that started this whole thing with distance, distant learning, that there are people in far-flung areas that want to learn, and they need to be able to get there. So I think in India, you are absolutely right. Uh, there is the limitation of availability of internet, so you'll have to figure out how to disseminate the information to those students, so maybe surveying them is a useful way to go. Do they go? Do they have cyber cafes? Do they go elsewhere to learn when they don't they have access to a private tutor? They go to cyber cafe. You know the problem is uh, they they are adapted towards you know, using mobile phones today. Okay, yes. they may they have good number of mobile phones today, but the, as I said, the connectivity is an important issue, which is present in US, which is not present in India. Okay. That is the biggest problem when you go travel across in the uh, railway system or outside certain areas where, the, where there's, a, there's a cross connection. Okay, those places you will not find proper network connectivity. And we face it even today, right? It is not present because maybe because of the population which is there in US and the population which is there in India. It's a huge difference there, right? So that is again a big factor. Second, as I said, the cost, the economic the economic issue, which is very important here, right? Now, I mean, I, mean, I, I, have, I have heard about IGNO who are doing this, but I have not seen them or not found anyone who can use the IGNO issue or, or go to Savvy Cafe, which has been placed by IGNO, right? So I think if you can uh, do something on this, number one, it will be definitely better. <clears throat> that is why probably we have thought about this, the, you know, the discussion. So the people, teachers who are here or those who are attending this particular uh, webinar they can listen to this right uh second thing which is which is important in my way or my understanding is that uh blended learning has a cost as you said rightly said it has a cost cost in the sense that today you're giving a lecture to some to someone and tomorrow you're asking them to read it or uh, learn it from that and come come up with a problem or with this or with an answer like that right assignment something of the sort now that itself again, how how does how they submit it? Normally in a hybrid mode, what we what, what we have seen in India again, okay, because blended learning per se is different from hybrid learning, right? Totally yeah. different. Right? Mm -hmm. Though it is not exactly different, but very much different from each other, right? right. Now, how you think of my binding these two, wherein a student who is not so much well known about this particular mode, right? How can they think about it? Okay, very good questions. So I think, yes, India does present a unique situation. In fact, many developing countries do. So I think if you were interested in thinking about blended learning, maybe a useful first, way, first step, first way to look at it would be your students are already either commuter students, which means if I think Durgapur, they either reside in Durgapur or they are in the hostels, right? They're already there. When they're there, they are not in their villages. So the way to then look at it is the students will attend class, they will go home. They will either go home or they will go to the dormitory. The dormitory, the hostel. They'll go to hostel, hostel has Wi-Fi. But they're doing their homework, they could use some additional help. So then the resources can be used by the students who are in the hostel. The resources can be used outside of class for the students who return to their parents' home or to their home in Durgapur. So you're really thinking of the students that are already enrolled at your institution. So in the first step, you are not thinking of these students who are in far-flung areas 
which for the United States, it is an easier way to get them into online learning, not necessarily blended Absolutely. learning. Absolutely. So you are not thinking online because you are not thinking online learning. Therefore, you want to think of the students that you already have. Right? I use blended learning for the students that are coming to class three times a week. Right? So that's the way to think about it. So that's the one thing. Um, the other thing that you asked was, uh, you mentioned something about cost. I lost that. Yeah, I'm lost in the sense that, I mean, how much, because it involves uh, the Dr. cost. Dr. Bhattacharya, I would like to, um, yeah. uh, I would like to add something. Dr. Bhattacharya, please, please one. Please, please. Yeah, yes, that is, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shudipta Roy, for enrich, uh, for this enriching lecture on blended learning. We have uh, learned many things from you. Uh, and from our experience. First of all, I would like to share in this webinar that I'm very much thankful to Dr. Shudita Roy. COVID period, uh, she actually, she used, uh, she uh, still now uh, using the Canvas uh, learning management system in USA. And I came to know about Canvas from her. Not only that, she helped me a lot to adopt Canvas. Uh, uh, canvas. And uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, thankful to Shudita because she guided me and she gave me the idea about Canvas, which is learning management system. And Shudita, you must be very happy to know that in Dugapu Women's College, we have started using Canvas LMS. Uh, with our students of commerce department and of course our economics department. Should we adopt this canvas in a larger way, reaching, trying to reach out many other students of the college? Now, what Pinakida, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, is asking a very relevant question that in India, how the US system of blended learning will be applicable? I think that is the major question by him. But the thing is, uh, blended learning cannot be a substitute method of teaching, but it can be a complementary method of teaching. Absolutely. And nowadays, Absolutely. yes, so it cannot be a substitute. But uh, we must not be, uh, in modern times and nowadays, we must not be rigid about the method of teaching. That is about traditional method. Absolutely. That's true. So we should uh, with my of teaching methods and blended learning what should be the experience a wonderful method that we should now well, madam madam once again uh this this reflects this so I think facing we that go off soon we should go to the next one we should go to the next yes. one uh the third one the third link because this will expire soon that's the reason why you are why your voice is cracking yes Okay, let's it's go to the third Yes, our team will provide us. Yeah, we'll come back to the third, third, uh, third. The thing is, I, I just want to... The third link, please, please. Can you hear me? Hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? We can, but I think we will join you in the third link. Yes, please check your emails. Uh, we have sent the third link. Yes. 